A while ago I did a video on the difference between CAT 6 and CAT 7 that became pretty popular. And recently a lot of questions have come up about CAT 8, how it differs from CAT 7 and 6, as well as what you should be using on your next cable run. If you want to know more about CAT 8, then stay tuned for the rest of this video. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe and click that notifications icon so you'll be notified of any new content. I've been asked many times, what type of cable should I be using for a home or small office? And what makes any of the network cables any different? And I did do a video on the basic differences between CAT 6 and 7 a while back, which I'll post a link to. But today I want to mainly focus on CAT 8. We'll cover how to terminate CAT 8 and discuss the differences between 7 and 8. At the end of the video, I'll give you my thoughts on which type of cable I would use if I was creating a new run and why. To get started, let's take a quick look at the basic construction of CAT 7 and 8 and examine them side by side. And we'll start digging into the differences. For starters, let's take a quick look at the differences in the cables. Now, I've only got here CAT 7 and CAT 8 just to draw that comparison. Again, I'll link to a previous video if you want to know more. But the one thing that becomes inherently obvious is that as they increase the frequency and the capacity through the cables, they get a little thicker. It's a little less significant than going from 6 to, um, to 7, but there is a difference in the actual conductor or uh, overall cable size. If we look at the other end and we take a look at the shielding, you can kind of start to see that the CAT7 shielding is a little thicker, uh, a little more dense, so the shielding overall is better than what you're going to get on a CAT7 cable. And obviously the reason for that is the higher frequencies. There's also a little bit of difference in how they twist and shield the conductors. Um, both are have foil conductors on each of the pairs, but you can see, and I'll try to zoom in a little bit here, but you can see that the CAT7 has got a little bit more twist and a little bit more shielding to it. So it's overall just a slightly higher grade cable. It's not huge. It's not like the difference that we saw between CAT6 and CAT7 um, where they added the shielding. This is, they're both shielded, but shielded differently. So if we begin to break these down a little bit, the other thing I want to point out is as we peel away the shielding on this stuff, the conductors are actually a little different. So if we pull back and say, let's take a look at the conductor size, you probably won't be able to tell on the video here, but this is actually 23 gauge conductor, which is thicker than what you see on CAT6. And this actually is 22 gauge conductor. So it, that's, that compensates for some of the extra thicknesses that you see. Zoom in a little bit here, but here you can sort of tell that this is much thicker cable on the conductor side. So with 22 gauge, they've got more surface area, so they're able to, to uh, get more signal through the, through the copper. So in terms of the cable, it's pretty obvious what we're seeing here is an overall more robust cable. Um, but there's more to, to it than that, and there's more differences than that. So let's take a look at the connectors that are used. The one thing I did want to point out is these metal connectors, the crimp connectors, are not the best in the world, but they do meet the, they do meet the speed requirements of a 10 gigabit network. But they have recently started coming out with a connector that looks more like this. It's a little bit more robust, but it's still not quite as robust as the one that you see here. And we'll get into that here in just a second. But just to highlight the differences, um, in case you don't recall, this is the key grounded keystone for CAT7. And these are the grounded connectors for CAT7. So let's focus in on the differences and what makes this a little bit different. So for starters, you can see that if I compare the two, they're physically much bigger. So the CAT8, let me see if I can get a better shot there. The CAT8 is significantly longer than the CAT7 was. And there's a couple of reasons for that. There's a lot of internal shielding difference and how they've constructed this both on the inside of the connector the, the uh, wire cap, um, compensation for the larger gauge, and the, um, 
things that actually gr uh, ground on the outside of the cable, like this clip here, you can kind of see that these actually slide back and forth. And that's so that you can maintain a good solid um, ground connection once we get into actually terminating these. And we'll get into how that all goes together here in just a second. I'm just giving you an overview now so we can kind of get a better idea of what the differences are. The biggest difference is in this type of connector. This is actually built completely different as well. This has some circuit board material in it for better shielding. And these are actually easier to put together. Overall, what you're seeing here is you're seeing a spring-loaded back, again, for grounding. And you're seeing a much more robust all-metal connector versus what you saw over here. So this is significantly different than it has been. This is also a screw-on. So when you actually screw this on, it tightens everything up. So it's a completely different connector, obviously much more expensive, but this gives you a better idea of kind of how this looks going to look when we're done. As you'll see when we complete and as you see when we terminate these things, CAT 8 is quite robust. But we'll talk about the differences in specs as well because it's important to know what you're getting for that extra money and whether or not it's actually worthwhile. So let's go ahead and terminate the RJ45 side. So the first thing we're going to do is we got to make sure that we insert this uh, locking boot. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble with this connector. So I'm going to go ahead and push that on there for now. I went through the liberty of, uh, of scoring the insulation and putting a slight cut to it so that we can actually break this off. So let's pull this out. Okay, so let's go ahead and pull this shielding back. And again, there's a couple things we can do with this shielding. We can fold it straight back, tape it and trim the excess, or we can wrap it around kind of like this and tape it. I kind of prefer, although it's a little more work, I kind of prefer just pushing it straight back like this and then putting my uh, tape around it. And the reason I do that is because it makes it a little bit thinner. If you wrap the insulation around it, it gets a little thick. So I'm going to start by going to hold this back here nice and snug. And let's get our tape on there. Okay, so now we have taped up our insulation. We'll go ahead and trim this excess off because we don't need it. Okay, there we go. So next what we want to do is actually separate these these pairs. So let's go ahead and do that. And the next thing we want to do is remove the foil. And you want to cut the foil off flush. Okay, now that we've pulled back all the insulation, our our job here is to actually use these um, color patterns to actually insert the proper conductors in there. So as you can see, this is actually broken up into two parts. So this top here, which is for these four holes here, is actually, and we're going to use the B configuration. So it's going to be our green and white, and then orange and white. Those are going to be up on the top. And on the bottom, you'll see which is actually um, identified on the side. So the B is going to be actually uh, white, blue, blue, and then white, brown, and then brown. So we're going to start with actually doing the top here. So let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and begin with our green wire. So I'm going to untwist that. And straighten that out a little bit. And now we need the orange. So we'll need orange and white. Okay, so let's go ahead and put our green white. And let's put our orange and white. into the top, kind of like this. And we'll push that guy all the way down. 
so we can what we want to do is keep this bring this up close so you may have to reroute your wires a little bit but what you want to do is when this is open this connector is going to fit right into that where the where those um, notches are so what you want to make sure is that the shielding is well within this area here so probably going to want to go a little bit closer kind of like that okay so now we're ready to put the top two on and if we look at the side we're going to see that and it's probably hard to see on the video but we have the blue it's going to be on this side and the brown white is going to be on this side so let's start with the brown So this one's just going to clip right on the top here. Keep your wire kind of safe there. Keep it straight so the connector doesn't move. So you want to kind of keep this somewhat straight. And then the blue white. Do the blue. And then we'll do the white. So what we end up with is something that looks like this. Now obviously we can't leave the wires this long, so let's go ahead and trim those guys up. So we'll do this by taking the top row first, pull it apart a little bit, and then let's trim up the bottom. So we got those, and then this one here, when you pull these back a little bit, you have to make sure they don't slip out of the groove. So when you're done, it looks something like this. You have nice and smooth edges, everything's been trimmed up, and everything's in position. Okay, now that we have our all our uh, conductors inserted into this plastic insert, now our task is to actually insert it into the connector. Now what we're going to want to do is put this in approximately like this. So we actually insert this and push this in so that it begins to push down. And it's a little it takes a little pressure to do that. If you want to line this up kind of kind of over this notch here. So kind of like that. If you can see that or not, but you kind of push this in so that it begins to to fit right there and then you can actually use the connector to press it down so it looks something like this and if we put that open you can see that it's actually fit this bottom part fit over the that part of the um, insert and then the back wire is actually pushed across the back bar there so you have basically completed your crimp. Now you might have to actually use a pair of pliers to close this, especially on Cat 8. And then what you do is you're going to bring this in and actually screw this in. Like that. And you might need to get a pair of pliers to finish this job. Because it can get a little, a little snug. There, something like that. And when you're done, you've completed your RJ45 termination, and that's what it should look like. Okay, so now that we've done the first end, let's do the keystone side of the ca of the cabling. So I've taken the liberty of uh, pre-stripping the insulation and the shielding and exposing the four pairs so that we can do the keystone. And as I kind of showed earlier, this one is a little bit more robust than the one in, in the, that I used in the Cat 7. So the first thing we're going to do is actually put all four pairs through. And we want to bring this as close as we can because what's going to end up happening is this is going to sit right inside here, right actually about there. And what we want to do is be able to grip that 
uh, foil so that we can get a proper shield. So I'm going to put it right around here, pretty close to the end. And again, we're going to use the B configuration. So the B configuration is actually the, um, it's actually the bottom row here. So the first thing we're going to want to do is actually break these out. So we'll start with the green pair here. We're going to go ahead and insert these. So there's the white. And then we'll loop this one around. And there's the green. And then over on this side, we'll do the orange. And then the white. All right, so now that we got our first side done, let's straighten this out a little bit and move to the second side. So here you can see that the A and the B configuration are the same. So we'll take, start with our blue wire. And the blue wire will come straight in here. The white wire will go on the outside. And again, we got to make sure they get inserted in that little notch correctly. And lastly, let's get our brown and white wire. And the white will go on the inside. And the brown on the outside. So now we got to do is make sure that these are carefully pushed in. Flush when we actually mount the housing on. Oh, looks good. So now we have our cable and our insert, our plastic insert. Now the next thing we want to do is cut these excess off. Okay, and there we have it. So this is what it should look like. And now we're ready to insert this. And as I mentioned earlier, this is polarized. So we're going to look for the, the notch. Slide this in here. Make sure it gets inserted in there. You have to push a little bit because those wires are in there. Once you get it started, the actual clamp will take care of it. So once you have it in there, then you can push this closed. And if you need to, use a pair of needle nose to actually finish this job because well, you want these to lock here. Now we can go ahead and finish this off. You can hear it click once you actually lock it into place. You want to do both sides because this has to lock on both ends. You can kind of see it here. There's a little bit of a notch here that clips in. And that's about it. Now we've got our shielding inside. We've got our termination. And to finish it off, we're going to go ahead and put this tie wrap on here. Which is just to prevent the backing from falling off during handling and so on. And that's it. Cut that off. And there you have it. So that's our terminated, terminated keystone. Okay, now that we've actually completed, obviously I can't test for 40 gigabits right now. So I'm going to go ahead and run this test just to make sure that at least our workmanship is good. Okay, so as you can see, we passed at least the conductivity test. So at least me, it means we actually wired it up correctly, which is a good place to start. So at least we put this thing together right and it's passed the test. Now that we've seen how these, this cable is actually put together and we've taken a quick look at the difference between CAT7 and CAT6, let's talk a little bit more about the specifications. If you look at this chart, um, I've listed all of the basically the speed uh, in both gigabits per second as well as uh, the megahertz, the frequency. And as you can see from the chart, uh, ranging all the way from 5e to cat 8, it varies significantly. But one of the things that was I found interesting, actually both cat 7 and cat 8 are rated for 40 gigabit. The only difference is that in if you're using a cat 7, you're only limited to 15 meters, so you're basically limited to jumpers or short runs. The CAT8 will get you all the way to 30 meters, which in the grander scheme of things isn't that far either. So the moral of this story is that you, despite having the extra expense and you know using the best cables that you can find or money can buy right now, the CAT8 still not going to get you far distances. So if you're planning on running 
you know, uh, 200 feet, you're probably not going to get there with any cable other than, you know, potentially um, fiber optics. So at this point, these are the limitations. You are limited. You are limited to to length and and distance. So if we look at these, we can see just a quick comparison. That basically, obviously, everything's backwards compatible. So CAT eight, seven, six gig is all backwards compatible to one gig. My personal opinion on you know what wires to what to run is I would probably be looking at 6A. Um, 6A will give me the 10 gigabit, and for most of us, that's the sweet spot. Uh, the 1 gigabit, this, if you're running CAT6, you'll obviously be able to use the 2.5 gigabit networking that's becoming extremely popular nowadays. But if you're looking into the future, if you're running cable, I would suggest looking at 6A or 7. Let's take a look at a quick price difference so we can get a better feel for that. And that gives you an idea of why I'm selecting what I'm selecting. As you can see, obviously the cheapest run, the cheapest cable run, and this is assuming a couple things. This is assuming a 100-foot run. Um, this is assuming that you are using uh, RJ45 on one side and a Keystone on the other. The simplest or the cheapest way to go will be to run a CAT6 cable. That you can do for approximately $13.98. And these are average prices I got from both Monoprice and Amazon. The 6A and the 7 will cost you a little bit more, but they're very close together. As you can see, there's not a whole lot of difference between 6A and 7, and arguably won't make that much difference per run, given that each each house probably has, you know, 5 to 10 runs at the most. You're not going to, unless you got a big, huge house. So the extra cost isn't going to be a huge burden. That kind of changes a little bit when you get to Cat 8. So Cat 8 is going to cost you twice as much as Cat 7. So the investment's going to be considerably more. Now, in and of itself, that might not be bad. However, what are you really gaining for it? If these runs are shorter and you have some needs for, you know, planning for the future for 25 or 40 gigabit, then obviously it's worth it. Or if you're looking at a just a main feed to go from, you know, a closet to, you know, a server or something like that, obviously it's worth it. So you have to decide kind of for yourself where that sweet spot is. To me at this point, Cat 8 is really planning for the future, a future that's probably years away at this point because of the mainstream availability of 10 gigabit is just barely becoming available and 2.5 gigabit's kind of taken over the small business home market. So that's my take on it. That's what I would recommend at this point is that you do 6A or 7. Now, that said, those are obviously for, for um, wall runs. If you're never going to plan to run 10 gigabit and you know that for sure and cost is an absolute, you know, limitation, then at least do CAT 6. You'll comfortably get the 1 gig performance. You'll comfortably get the 2.5 gig performance. And on short runs of 30 meters or less, you'll get the 10 gig performance. So, um, although depending on the cable, you know, the quality of the cable may be you may, you may or may not get problems. But I haven't had any issues with smaller runs on CAT6 trying to get 10 gig. But you kind of are limiting yourself if you do the CAT6. So again, I would do the CAT6A for wall runs. Just because if you're just going to go through the trouble of, of uh, running cables, you might as well put a little bit of future proof in it. But I just wouldn't put as much as CAT8 in there. Anyway, I hope that helped and cleared up some of the questions that have been brought up. And if you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like. And as always, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. Click that notifications icon so you'll be notified of any new content. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.